Let's take a look at patents. Patents are one of the three main types of intellectual property, but there's quite a panoply of intellectual property types. Copyright protects an author's work, an author's original work, and it gives the author the right to stop anyone from making copies of that work or exploiting that work. A trademark protects a sign that indicates the origin of goods and services, and it gives the owner of a trademark the right to stop other people from attaching that sign to their products. A trade secret is some useful information that is kept a secret a database right is a property right in Europe in the contents of a database. A design is a right that prevents people copying the non-technical elements of a product's design. A geographical indication is a special term that describes goods from a particular region, so parmesan cheese or champagne, sparkling wine. And plant variety, plant feeders rights, uh, give breeders the rights to stop people from growing plants that they have bred without authorization. And all of these intellectual property types have something in common. What they have in common is that developing the product to the stage where it's going to be brought to the market can be very expensive and quite a lot of investment might be required in developing something. But without intellectual property law for protection, that work could be just piggybacked on without any benefit to the creator. And so intellectual property rights then protect that investment. Now, copyright, trademarks and patents are probably the three most important types. And we're going to look a little bit at patents and see how they work and what the justification for them is. So a patent is a set of exclusive rights granted by a national government to an inventor in exchange for the disclosure of his invention. And a patent right is a monopoly right to prevent others from making, using, selling, or distributing the patented invention without permission within that territory. And it's usually granted for 20 years, typically. I mean, there's a lot of variety, but for our purposes, you know, typically 20 years. Now, what are the justifications then for patents and how are they different for the justifications for copyright and trademarks, for example? Well, in one respect, there is a contract between the society and the inventor. So the inventor gets a stronger right in exchange for disclosure. So. If you come up with a great invention, if you come up with a new way to make beer that requires much less water, for example, one thing you can do is you can get into the beer making business and you can create beer that um, uses less water, is cheaper to produce, is more environmentally friendly, and people might buy that beer and you would be successful in the selling of that beer. Your capacity to do that relies on your ability to keep your process a secret. And you might be successful in that, and there is law to protect trade secrets. But as a society, we lose when useful inventions are not dispersed and used as widely as possible. So a patent is granted to an inventor in exchange for disclosure of the invention. 
And so as a society then, something that would have been a secret is now out there to be exploited by everyone. Now, there is a time delay from when the patent is disclosed, when the invention is disclosed, to when it's free to be used by anyone. But in the grand scheme of things, that's not very long. And of course, if the new invention is valuable enough, people will license the right to use it from the inventor. And the property right in the patent makes that possible. Another justification for patents is that, like copyright, like the author's right, if someone creates an invention, you know, they have a moral right, a natural right to have control over that. That's another approach. We could also see a patent as a reward, that people should be rewarded for their hard work, and the patent is that reward. And we could also see a patent system giving benefits to society because it creates an incentive for inventors to create. So all of those things are in the mix to some extent, but really the main justification and the main way we look at patents is as a deal between the inventor and society. So the inventor discloses his invention in exchange for the patent. And it's a deal. The inventor gets the patent, society gets the disclosure. So patents incentivize the disclosure of inventions rather than relying on trade secrets for protection. And so as a society then, we get publications of scientific discoveries. Well, discoveries is a bad word there now, but we get disclosure of new inventions. And that progresses the society and progresses technology. Patents were considered so important that in the 1800s they were hard-coded and written into the United States Constitution. And here's an interesting um, description or comment on why we have patents from a 1991 case. The underlying purpose of the patent system is the encouragement of improvements and innovation. In return for making known his improvement to the public, the inventor receives the benefit of a period of monopoly during which he becomes entitled to prevent others from performing his invention, except by license. And it's this exchange here, it's this deal between the inventor and society that's important. You get the patent in exchange for the disclosure. So it's not a reward. It's a deal. It's a type of contract. Society gets something, the inventor gets something. To that end, though, patents must be clear. The inventor must actually disclose the invention fully in order to get the patent. Otherwise, society isn't getting anything in exchange. So a patent must be clear so that the scope of the monopoly is clear, but also that society can benefit from the disclosure. So if we're giving someone a monopoly right, well, we need to know what the boundaries of that right are. But we also need to know how the invention works. So, like, I can't get a patent in my new way of making beer that uses less water unless I tell you how to do it. If I don't fully disclose the process so that anyone who is competent in beer making can exploit my new process, my new invention, then I don't get the patent. Sometimes an inventor wants the patent but doesn't want to disclose. And that can explain why patents are sometimes difficult to read. So the precision required to, to make clear the scope of the monopoly is one of the reasons that makes patents difficult to read because the drafter of the patent, the patent attorney, is trying to make it as general as possible so that as much real estate, so to speak, can be fenced in so that the, mon the monopoly can be as large as possible. 
but there's also an extent to which the patent hold, the patent applicant wants to disclose only as much as is necessary to receive the patent. So sometimes some details might be held back and kept secret, and, and that can be a problem. It can also lead to some of the cumbersome language we find in patent descriptions. Patents are essential to some industries. So some industries just would not work at all were it not for the patent system. Software, for example, relies principally on copyright. And you could imagine the software industry working reasonably okay without patents. But the drug business simply couldn't work without patents because it costs an awful lot of money to research drugs, to see if they work, to test their efficacy, to test their safety. That all costs millions and millions of dollars or millions and millions of euro before anything can be sold. However, once it's known that a drug works for a particular, as a particular treatment, and it's known that it's safe, it can actually be very, very cheap to produce the drug. So if it wasn't for patents, someone could spend millions developing a drug, and then a competitor could just start manufacturing it. So there would be no incentive then to invest millions in the development of drugs. Now, this difference between what it costs to manufacture a drug and the cost of the drug to purchase can sometimes seem very unfair and unjust. I mean, if it costs 50 cent to make a tablet and a drug company is selling it for 50 euro, that seems like a massively unreasonable markup and it seems like massive exploitation of sick people. But of course, the drug company has to recoup the investment cost in the research and development and testing of the drug. So that discrepancy there between the cost of production and the cost of sale can be explained. And of course, it only works if we have patents. Without patents, someone else could just make the drug and sell it. Patents work on a country-by-country country basis. So patents are a national affair. So an Irish patent is valid in Ireland. And if you have a patent on a product or a process, let's say you have a patent on a product. Well, if you have an Irish patent on that product, you can prevent the manufacture or sale or distribution or importation of that product into Ireland. A UK patent then is valid in the UK. A French patent is valid in France. There's no single European patent valid throughout the entire EU. However, there is a European patent office. And this office was set up by the European Patent Convention quite a, a few years ago now. And what the European Patent Office does, it is it allows an inventor to file a single application at the European Patent Office, which is primarily in Munich with an outpost in The Hague. And as part of that application, the patent applicant can specify the countries where the patent is sought. So with one application, the applicant could say, I want a patent from Ireland, a patent from France, and a patent from Spain. It could designate those countries. Now, typically, an applicant will select all of the countries. But if the patent application is successful, the patent owner then ends up with a bundle of national patents. So it'll be like a, a basket full 
of patents, an Irish one, a French one, a Spanish one, a German one. There is no such thing at the moment as a European patent. There is a European patent office, which is subcontracted, so to speak, to issue patents on behalf of national governments. Interestingly, the European Patent Office isn't an EU body as such, and so non-EU countries are also members of, have signed up to the European Patent Convention. So you can get a Turkish patent, for example, from the European Patent Office. So this makes it very different then from, say, a European Union trademark, which is a single trademark that applies across all of the EU. The European Patent Office does not give out a European patent. So at the European Patent Office, an inventor can request a patent for one or many of the various countries that have signed up to the convention. Now, you might ask, why wouldn't someone select all of them? Well, of course, selecting all of them would cost more. Uh, patents have to be paid for and you have to pay an annual fee to maintain them. So depending on the product, you might want only certain countries. So let's consider this Harlog here. This is an interesting product. It's a Harley that looks like it's made of wood, but it's actually made of foam. So if you get a whack over the head with it, it's not going to knock you out. And this is quite a, a cool product and it's, it's quite a successful one. And this is patented in Ireland. So there's an Irish patent on this product. Now, you might ask then, would it be worth patenting this in other countries? So one thing you might want to do is you might want to prevent copycats manufacturing this. And of course, the owner of this product and the owner of this patent, if they had only a patent for Ireland, then there would be nothing to stop anyone producing this product outside of Ireland. So some factory in China could be cranking these out like mad and there'd be nothing that the designers and inventors of the Harlog could do about it. So you might think then, well, it's worth getting a patent for China where it might be manufactured or other places where it might be manufactured. But of course, that's going to cost money. And the big question then is, how useful is that? Because if you have a patent on an invention, you can prevent the production of that product in the countries where you have the patent. So having a patent on having an Irish patent on this invention makes it possible to stop people from producing this product in Ireland. But importantly, the patent also prevents anyone else importing the product into Ireland or distributing the product in Ireland or selling the product in Ireland. So even if a factory in China could be churning these out by the hundreds or thousands and selling them really, really cheap, they can't be sold in Ireland because they would be infringing the patent that is valid in Ireland. And so it would be possible, for example, for someone to manufacture um, similar products in China and import them into Germany. But then the makers of the Harlog would have to ask themselves, well, look, how many products are we actually going to sell in Germany anyway? How many hurlers are there in Germany? Now, clearly there are some. But the question would come up, is it actually worth getting a German patent? How many of these might be sold in China? How many hurlers are there in China? Probably not an awful lot. Is it worth, you know, protecting the invention in China. There would be a, an upfront and an ongoing cost associated with that. So depending on the product, 
the inventor may only want protection in certain countries. Now, typically, however, if the invention is is worthwhile, the inventor will want to protect it in many, many countries around the world. And that can actually be quite expensive. Um, patents in themselves are not terribly expensive, but paying the lawyers to file the patents, to write the patents and file them can, can be saucy enough. The European Patent Convention covers many countries. It covers all of the EU countries and also includes the UK, Turkey, Switzerland, Serbia, for example. So it's beyond the EU. It's any country that has signed up, you can get a patent for that country via the European Patent Office. So an application for a patent is made to the relevant patent office. That can be a national office or it can be the European Patent Office. The application is examined. If it meets all the criteria, the application is published. At that point, then, third parties can make observations or oppose the granting of the patent. And in the absence of any opposition, in the absence of any problems, the patent will be granted. If two people file the same invention on different days, then the first person to file will be the person that gets the patent. It's important that the patent, uh, the invention, is kept secret until the patent application is filed. At which point, of course, everyone gets to see it. The law in Ireland and the wording of the European Patent Convention are very similar. And that's not a surprise. I mean, it wouldn't make sense if they weren't closely aligned. Because obviously the European Patent Office is going to grant people an Irish patent. And in the Patents Act in Ireland, there's no definition of an invention. But a patentable invention must be susceptible of industrial application. So it must be a, a technical thing. It must be, uh, you know, it must be, have, have an application in industry. It must be a technological thing or a technical thing. It must be new, so it must be novel. There's no benefit to society in granting a patent in something that we already know about. So the invention must be new. And one of the requirements is it must involve an inventive step. That's the language in the, in the legislation. And in European Patent Convention Article 52, we can see the language is the same. So what does susceptible of industrial application mean? Well, invention shall be considered as susceptible, ah, susceptible of industrial application if it can be made or used in any kind of industry, including agriculture. So that's fairly broad. An invention shall be considered as having an inventive step if, having regard to the state of the art, it is not obvious to a person skilled in the art. So somebody could claim they have made an advance in chemistry and that would be evaluated using the person skilled in the art of chemistry. So the fact that I'm impressed by it and I think it's novel and new would mean nothing because I know nothing about chemistry. I'm not skilled in chemistry. Where with computer science my opinion of it might be more relevant. So patent law uses this notional person skilled in the art, which makes sense. It doesn't make sense to use the perceptions or the views of someone taken off the street because they would not be competent in chemistry or in computer science or physics or, you know, aeronautical engineering. Which is in contrast, of course, to trademark law, which is very much interested in the view of the person on the street. An invention shall be considered to be new if it does not form part of the state of the art, which is fair enough. And so 
In patent law, people talk about the prior art. So you can't get an invention for something if it's already out there. And often, a lot of work has to go into finding earlier examples of a product or earlier instances of an invention in order to prove that the patent should not be granted. A number of things then are not considered inventions. So a discovery or scientific theory or math mathematical method is not an invention. So something like Boyle's Law is a discovery. That's figuring out a fundamental law of physics. Now, a pressure cooker that uses Boyle's Law to cook food, well, that's an invention. That someone has taken the principle and made something out of that, invented something based on that. And often there can be a bit of blurring, you know, between the discovery and invention. So there's there's a lot of work for lawyers there. And aesthetic creation isn't an invention. So we have copyright to protect creative works. A poem, a book, a novel, if you'll forgive the pun, however new it is, however novel it is, is not an invention. It's an aesthetic creation. A scheme, rule or method for performing a mental act, playing a game or doing business or a program for a computer. Now that's an interesting one. A way of doing business, a business model, for example, is not an invention in Europe. In the US you can patent a business model, but in Europe you cannot. And a program for a computer cannot be patented in Europe either or at least on paper. Also, the presentation of information, a way of presenting information, cannot be patented. It's not an invention. So, a business model cannot be patented, nor can a computer program. Now, it turns out, though, that in reality, software patents are granted all the time by the European Patent Office. So it's a bit of a contentious issue. The law has been pulled and stretched over many years to the point at which this bar on the granting of a patent for a program for a computer is, is it doesn't really mean what it used to mean. It is arguable that the way technology has evolved makes that position reasonable and that the European Patent Office is really just responding to the reality of the world now. Or you could equally argue that it's just ignored the European Patent Convention and gone off and done its own thing anyway because it wanted to. The truth is perhaps somewhere in between, but both of those arguments are, are sustainable when it comes to software patents. Interestingly, a uh, method of treating a human, or an animal even, by surgery cannot be patented. So if you figure out a way of doing, say, a kidney transplant in a better way, you can't patent that. Now, if you come up with some sort of instrument, some sort of surgical instrument that makes it better, well, you could patent that, that physical device, but you can't patent a method for treatment of a human. And that's, that's fair enough, I think. I think that's a, a good thing. We don't want to stop people from being treated because someone has a patent on the way it's done. We don't want to stop doctors healing people. Furthermore, a patent can't be granted on something that would be contrary to public order or morality. 
no, that's quite a broad and quite a vague provision. And you could ask, how do you decide what's immoral? But we do have some guidance, so some things would be outlawed in Europe. Um, so if, for example, you had a new drug that was ideal for use in executions, and let's say that was, for some reason, its only possible use, you would not get a patent in Europe for that because in Europe we would consider executing people to be immoral. Similarly, if you came up with a new kind of landmine, you might not be able to get a patent for that because a landmine would be considered an immoral device. No, a gun per se isn't necessarily immoral, but a landmine is So we're interesting to speculate what other kinds of things might be precluded using the public order or morality clause. And of course people have different views of morality, so this is an interesting one. I want to just talk a little bit now about patent trolls. So, patents can be quite difficult to understand, but also they can give quite broad protections. There have been problems in the past, at a minimum, one could argue there are ongoing problems, with low-quality patents being granted, people being given patents for all sorts of things, especially in the US. And what has happened is that Companies have bought up these patents and then they try to make as much money from them as they can. But not by licensing the technology covered by the patent, but going after possible infringers of the patent. So let's say, for example, someone held a patent that might have covered the way Wi-Fi routers work. Well, one thing they could do is they could go to the manufacturers of Wi-Fi routers and say, look, you're infringing our patent here. You need to license this from us or there'll be a problem. We'll have to take you to court. But what patent trolls often did was they would go after people lower down the lower downstream, you know, the distribution. So they might say to a coffee shop that is using such a Wi-Fi router, or you're infringing our patent. And if you don't pay us, we're going to end up in court and you will be um, sued for patent infringement. And of course, the trick was to extort just a little amount of money from people so that it was cheaper to pay off the patent troll than it was to go to court. Because, of course, going to court, even if you win, could be very expensive. And it might be cheaper to just pay the couple of thousand dollars to make the problem go away. Some patent trolls would even go so far as to say, you're infringing one of our patents. And if you asked, which patents am I infringing? They'd say, oh, well, you know, come to court and find out or pay up. So this became a bit of a problem, especially in the US, and I believe ultimately there was some legislation brought in to try and deal with it. But if you hear the term patent troll, that's what that's talking about. So a patent troll is a company that owns patents, typically purchased perhaps from a business that went bust. The company isn't actually a, a company that does any invention or any development. And a patent troll runs a sort of extortion racket where the troll tries to get money out of you rather than go to court and be found to infringing the patent. 
And of course, the trick is to ask for just just a little enough, so little money that it's it's worthwhile. Now, I mentioned earlier that there is no such thing as a European patent. There is a European patent office, but no single European patent. Plans are afoot for a single European patent, a unitary patent that would be granted by the European Patent Office and that would apply then across all the participating states of the EU. So it would only be confined to the EU just because the way the law would have worked. But ultimately, you could have a situation where you could get a single patent that would apply across all of the countries of the EU. This plan has been afoot for many years and it required a minimum number of countries to sign up. The UK was going to sign up. That was before Brexit. It's not really clear now if the UK is still on board with that. Also, some countries objected to the fact that the patents wouldn't be translated into all the EU languages. So Spain and Italy were a bit cross about that. Ireland hasn't signed up yet either. Ireland would actually need to hold a referendum in order to sign up to this. It's not clear yet if it's going to happen. It is clear why it's desirable. It would be much better to just have a single patent that applies across all of the EU and that because goods can move freely across the EU anyway. I mean, it would be a disaster if you had a product that was on the market in all of the EU but couldn't be sold in France because there was some patent issue there. That would just make life very difficult for manufacturers. I mean, how do you stop the flow of goods from Spain and Belgium and Germany into France? You know, it just would be a big mess. So one can see why it's desirable. It'll be interesting to see if it actually does come to pass. It's been just on the horizon and at the any day now stage for many, many years at this stage. So we'll see what happens. The idea would be that national patents are enforced by national courts. So if you have an Irish patent and someone is importing something into Ireland that's covering that patent, you can go to court in Ireland to stop that. That can lead to inconsistencies. And the idea would be that we would have a European patent court, so a specific court for dealing with patent issues. There would be courts of first instance in Paris, Munich and London. Now that the UK has left the EU, that's probably not going to happen in London. There'd be a court of appeal in Luxembourg. There was going to be a training centre for judges in Budapest. You could see how this is all spread around, you know, everybody got a bit of something. We'll see if it, if it comes to pass. So, what do we need to know about patents then? Well, patents cover inventions. So, copyright is for creative work. Trademarks are for badges of origin. Patents protect inventions and they give the inventor a monopoly on the manufacture or sale or importation of products covered by that invention for a fixed period of time, typically 20 years. That patent is granted in exchange for disclosure. There's a trade there, there's a deal there. You get the patent, Society gets the invention. Patents are essential to some industries. So the drug industry simply would not work without patents. At the moment in Europe, we only have national patents, but the European Patent Office works as a one-stop shop. An invention must be novel, so it must be new. It must be disclosed. And there are some things that just can't be patented at all. 